Well, hello and welcome to the Thursday edition of DC Today. I actually am recording from my apartment. I, uh, New York City was just uh, hit with quite a thunderstorm. And so rather than go back to the office after I'd been down at Fox Studios recording on set with Larry Kudlow after the market closed, rather than go record in our studio at the office, I came straight to the apartment uh, reasonably soaking wet. And that is just a byproduct of the dedication I have to you to come here to record this. So let's get into it. It was CPI day and there's a few things I want to be able to go through. Um, all right, let me pull something closer here. Okay. The market was up 450 points today at one point, the Dow, and it closed up only 50. So it gave up most of the lead, on the day you ended up with the Dow up um, 15 basis points, 50 points, like I said, the S&P uh, just up, you know, only a few basis points, practically flat, NASDAQ up a small amount as well. All three had been up quite a bit. All three gave up their leads. Um, and what had happened was the bond market was all pretty much up, not a lot, but yields mostly across the curve had dropped one to two basis points. In the, in the aftermath of CPI. And so as bonds were going higher, equities were rallying quite a bit. And then at some point in the middle of the day, the bond yield started turning straight up. And that is more or less around the time equities reversed, at one point going negative, then making back. And there's just a lot of choppiness. So, you know, you definitely have volatility around the thing I talked about yesterday with different traders putting on and taking off and putting on new positions, hedges, things like that. Um, but that volatility is sort of explained by that. As to why it would have ever been up 450 points, the only thing I could think would have been some short covering. There wasn't anything fundamental that I could see that would drive that. Um, the CPI report was a little better than I expected, but not enough to change any of what would have been baked in already, which was that the Fed's likely looking to kind of do nothing at the next meeting. And then the, the, there's still a sort of a jump ball after that with a little bit of a uh, bias towards uh, not hiking again, but not a foregone conclusion there. And nothing changed out of that. I was expecting CPI to go up a little more than it did, but it does appear to me that the energy impact and headline inflation I was expecting didn't materialize till late enough in July that it didn't get captured in the data to the degree I would have expected. And so you really had a pretty benign report. They're expecting 3.3% headline CPI year over year. It came into 3.2. But again, I got to get in the weeds on it because um, the shelter number is still being tracked at 7.8%. That's a little lower than the eight handle from before, but just obnoxiously unrealistic of that 7.8. Um, you have, let's see here. Uh, owner's equivalent rent up 7.7 seven, and rental of primary residence up 8. And um, there's ongoing debate about whether or not the data should be 3% there, should be 1%. You know, I'm willing to take any number between 0 and 4, but not any number between 7 and 8 in terms of real life uh, shelter inflation right now. And so that is putting us um, at a higher place than we otherwise would be. Now, I want to point out even with that, that you, um, when you when you look at core uh, annualized over three months, which is not really what people do, and excuse me, I meant headline, total inflation, if it were annualized over three months, you'd be looking at 1.9%. Now, you're going to need more time than that because you don't annualize three months. You look over 12 months. I get it. You also, though, have core goods inflation, that is up 0.8%, less than 1% year over year. Now, you do have a lot of things like airfare that are down and other things like auto insurance that are up. I don't. I, I understand that there's a mixed bag depending on what people are buying. Um, I don't like the selectivity of when people were wanting to make a point previously or make a different point now by cherry picking what narrative tells their story. But I do believe this is part of the problem with a general price level theory that um, you really don't have such a thing as an aggregate price level and to uh, try to blend together things that are up 10 and things that are down 10, it makes for some, uh, you know, well, math is math, but it makes for some very odd practical conclusions. Um, 
So that's where we are on the inflation front. Energy prices will be the thing you're going to want to watch on headline. And then as far as core services go, and whether or not it lowers to a point, you know, where the Fed, you know, admits that this thing has gone on long enough, we shall see. So um, one other anecdotal point I wanted to point out is that two years ago, the S&P this very week was at 4450. And right now today, two years later, it's at 4450. Basically a flat S&P for 24 months. And this is part, and yet everyone knows it's been anything but flat along the way. Some really big drawdowns, some really big rallies. And this is the point I've been making. I did write a dividend cafe to this effect. I do not think this flattish range bound market that goes on for years is over. Um, I believe that we are in a post bull run, post bear run where you get a period of flattishness that has ups and downs on the way um, and yet nevertheless leads to a rather uh, dull response for an index investor. Now, the NASDAQ over two years is actually down 8%, but of course it was down significantly last year. It had been up a lot in the second half of 2021. It has been up a lot in the first half of 2023, and there's just such a big sell-off in between that it's still down. So here's the thing, though. Besides my tangential point about uh, equity indices in a two-year period like this, the 10-year bond yield was 1.3% two years ago, and it's now 4.1%. So the idea that anyone could have guessed that the bond yield was going to triple and that the S&P would be flat is just surreal. And that's the way markets go, that people can get right premises, which is very hard to do, and still get very wrong conclusions. And it happens all the time. And the notion that one just simply needs to know how things are going to shake out economically, and then they have an investment thesis to carry with that, it isn't true. And I've written about that quite a bit. All right, so I'm going to let you go there. Let us, uh, crude oil was down a little bit today. Um, I write more about inflation in the DC today, and there's a couple links that may be worth your time. And then tomorrow you get Dividend Cafe, and I'll look forward to recording that uh, still here from New York. And then um, I'll be flying back to California for the next two weeks, uh, late, late, late tomorrow night. So thank you for listening and reading and watching the DC today. Hope you've gotten a lot out of it, and I certainly welcome your questions as we continue to navigate through these very interesting times with inflation, with the economy, with bonds, with stocks, all the things that we literally eat, drink, sleep, breathe, and love at the Bonson Group. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.